All right, we have Benna just joined us. Hi, Benna. Hey, everyone. Chag Sameach. Happy holiday. I'm very delighted that you were able to join us. Uh, I put up a little slide here showing how uh, I understand you had several, you had a series of Bible study with Joe and Benna. Yeah, we did a little bit of that uh, during COVID. There's a... Uh, a little bit about Bereshit, and there's a little bit about Ezra, of Ezra and Nehemiah, if, any, if anyone wants, uh, those are available uh, on YouTube, I believe. Yeah, terrific. I'll let everybody guess which one of uh, these, you know, since it's, this is Joe and this is Benna, so I'll yeah. let them figure it out. I love your, I love your name because uh, we also have a son, Benaya, and we often call him Benna. Yeah, that's true. There you go. <laughs> so uh, Benna is not only a licensed uh, tour guide and lecturer, but he's got 20 years of experience. He uh, was born and grew up here in Israel with a very strong academic background uh, in uh, Israel studies, in Bible, in archaeology. It's actually, uh, I guess, this mix has drawn interesting celebrities, as you see here, and also um, has worked with the Discovery History and History Science channels. So we're very, very lucky to have Benna uh, give us a tour, a uh, virtual tour on Sukkot, and uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Okay, so shalom, everyone, and uh, welcome. And uh, I see uh, most have their cameras off, which is absolutely fine, but I'm going already to refer to something that I'm seeing right here from Canada. Dean, I believe, is the name. And I don't know if I'm saying it correctly. I absolutely love the uh, sukkah that you're sitting in. And uh, it's uh, done in a very traditional way. I'm sure you've seen this before. It's a, uh, if I need to classify it, I would say it's a Samaritan sukkah, by the way. You got it. So <laughs> it's a Samaritan sukkah that we have here, which is beautiful. And we are going to talk a little bit about uh, things that are related to uh, Samaritans. Now that I see the sukkah, I might actually uh, say a little something more in length about the Samaritans and their connection and, you know, uh, what's happening over there. Um, so we have approximately an hour and a half uh, for this uh, lecture about Sukkot. I will try to really tune in and, and find on the uh, uh, parts of uh, Sukkot that are more relevant in the times of the temple. In other words, at least 2,000 years ago, if not 3,000 years ago, if we go all the way back to the times of the first temple um, and the traditions that uh, were active during those days. Essentially, we could say that everything we do on Sukkot today is in memory of uh, the traditions that, in other words, this is uh, quite important to understand uh, what happened in the temple because it really opens our eyes and helps us understand why are we doing certain things that we're doing. Today. You cannot disconnect uh, the two. So if we want to start, um, and maybe the last thing I will say before we actually start is that I uh, am about to switch to uh, and share the screen. In other words, I won't be able to see you. Um, and I know that normally on these uh, lectures, everyone's sort of automatically muting themselves. Both the cameras are closed, but also, of course, the uh, the microphones. And, and that's fine. But I urge and encourage everyone uh, who has a question not to wait till the end, but to actually interject and ask. Oftentimes I could be running and just saying things and sort of automatically assume things about everyone's understanding. If anyone wants to make sure, wants to stop me as I go, uh, interject, take, unmute yourself, say, Ben, I just have a quick question. And specifically because I won't be able to see you, I need you to really interject. And if it's something I'm about to explain, I'll just say, I'll get there in a moment or I'll apologize or I'll say, let's, Keep that to the end because I'm in the middle of something, but very often times I find that these questions are instrumental to understanding what I'm saying. So don't hold back on your question. You if can also you use the chat if, if you aren't able to use your microphone. So that's great as well, but then I won't be able to see it very well as I share the screen. 
And that's yes. I'll, I'll note I'll, I'll notify you if someone does message. That works chat. for me. So that works Perfect. great, Rick. If you could just notify me and say, hey, I'm seeing something on the chat, that will go a long way. It'll be a great help. And if that's the case, I'm not even waiting, and we can start right away with. Uh, sharing that screen. Let me just maybe close one thing that I won't be needing here. And now let's open what I will be needing. So we have this and we have this and I don't need to optimize my video and we should be good. Just let me know. Are we right now seeing a, uh, the, uh, what is this called? The, the PowerPoint. <laughs> You're seeing a PowerPoint on a full screen, correct? Wonderful. Yes. Good. It's just confirming that. So, so when we start to talk about Sukkot, and we can read here uh, from Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 16, 16 starts with three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord, your God, at the place he will choose. By the way, just this one sentence, uh, books have been written about uh, what's, what's in this one sentence. Is it uh, only the men? How do we know? Uh, what is the place that the Lord chose? I mean, we know that the places of worship uh, traveled and moved uh, over the years. So, so this is something that uh, we, could, we could attack this uh, verse from, from various directions. But I actually want to just dwell uh, on the second word of the verse. And that is the, the word uh, times in English. But of course, in Hebrew, in the Bible, it says uh, regel or regalim, shlosha regalim. Now, the word regel in modern day Hebrew is a foot. And that's sort of what everyone thinks about uh, when, when they say regel today. And of course, then when we're thinking about pilgrimage, we're really thinking about what is called in Hebrew today, ali ala regel. Now, the word la'alot means to climb up, but it also means to ascend. And so there's a spiritual component in the word aliyah, for example, if you're uh, honored on a Saturday in a synagogue and you're called up to the bima and you're going to be uh, there physically as they read from the Torah and you get to say the blessing, then you're receiving an aliyah. In other words, you get to ascend. If you come to the land of Israel, if you immigrate, if you're like uh, Yair and you're born in America and you decide that you're... Uh, joining your Jewish brothers and sisters in the land of Israel, then automatically you are making Aliyah. Although you could be on Himalayas and you're much, much higher altitude than Israel, still the spiritual component here is what's relevant, and that's why it's called Aliyah. So we have Aliyah la Regel, there is a spiritual component, and then there is that Regel. Now the word itself, Regel, isn't very common in the Bible. Uh, we find it for sure. One of the most famous places where it's uh, found is in the story of Biliam. If you remember, Biliam is also a prophet. In fact, the Talmud tells us that perhaps the greatest prophet ever to live, whether he or Moses were greater, is something that uh, the Talmud is sort of, you know, asking itself. And uh, and if you recall the story of Biliam, he uh, he is striking his uh, his donkey, uh, his mare. Uh, female. And, and the reason he's, he's doing that is she is seeing an angel. He cannot see the angel and she's kind of pushing him against the, the stone wall, against the cliff. And she, she finally opens her mouth and, and says, why have you struck me three regalim? So why did you hit me three times? So the word regal is, is a time. So th this is the time of pilgrimage, uh, which is a wonderful explanation. But then um, there is something phenomenal that is discovered by a, uh, an Israeli archaeologist called Adam Zartal. He is not with us. He passed uh, a few years back. And uh, Zartal did something after 1967, after the Six Day War, uh, that we never had the opportunity to do. And that is to actually survey an archaeological survey of the hills and the, the valleys of the uh, West Bank, which is mostly you know, hills and valleys. And he takes his uh, students, and over the course of 30 years, he is simply walking up and down these hills, collecting fragments of uh, pottery shards and anything that is archaeological that he can identify in the field. He is examining and marking, and, uh, and he notices these uh, foot-shaped enclosures. That is how he called them. 
these regals, and we have some of Zartal's um, actual drawing here. He's doing today, by the way, one of his uh, students, his follower, Shai Bar, a, a, an archaeologist from, from Haifa University, is still doing it. So you can actually see some of these uh, foot shaped enclosures. And here is just a beautiful one here. And um, there is nothing there. There's no stratigraphy. They haven't been used and then destroyed and used again. This isn't your typical tell if you're familiar with uh, biblical archaeology. We're not trying to uh, sort of find a timeline that is described here. What we actually have is an enclosure in this particular one that you're seeing right now. We have an enclosure within the enclosure. Um, you tell me, I mean, I think the, the shape of a foot is quite clear. And so we have uh, a, an archeological site that is sort of nomadic in style. There's almost nothing in it except for a stone enclosure around it. It is never at the height, by the way, of the hill. At the same time, it is not at the bottom of the valley. So it's relatively accessible and it's always surrounded by other hills around it that are usually higher, but not so much higher that there is sort of a, a disconnection between the two. In other words, you're able to stand on a hill around the foot enclosure and see it. And that's very interesting as well. So now we're starting to put these uh, elements together and we're thinking about the people who are coming from all over the world um, on those three holidays. And they are actually stopping and camping in these foot shape enclosures. Now, some of them may just be um, good camping sites on the way for the pilgrims that are used three times in the year during the pilgrimage. But at the same time, some of them may actually commemorate uh, certain events that have taken place over the years. In other words, you choose on your pilgrimage to actually visit sites that already hold some meaning. One of the most famous of the sites that we have a foot shape enclosure next to, and it's a site that in its name also appears many, many times uh, in the Bible. It's probably not the same location or definitely not the same location we could say today, is the site of uh, the biblical Gilgal. Now, Gilgal is another sort of rare word in the Bible, but we remember Gilgal because that's where Joshua crosses the Jordan River. Sartal's theory is saying, no, we have a number of these foot-shaped enclosures, and now you're seeing the map. This is the Jordan River here. So we're looking at the Jordan uh, Valley, and you can actually see uh, in the cases where, sorry, just a moment, where Sartal identified these enclosures, and imagine how hard that must be because these are archaeological sites that are still there that are thousands of years old, but he actually managed to notice, A, the distancing between them somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, 10 miles or so between the sites. In other words, a good distance uh, for a family to walk, let's say, in a day as they're making their way towards Jerusalem. You can see that there is uh, more of them over here. And then, of course, the theory of Zartal is that perhaps this one specifically here, he thinks, is um, maybe the uh, biblical Gilgal, for example, or is it this one, sorry, by Yafit. Um, so perhaps they, they actually retain and hold more than just um, that particular meaning of it's a place on the way to Jerusalem, but it's also something else that has happened uh, in these locations. So those are the, uh, that's something where archeology span today in the 20th century is, is showing us and offering us uh, some new understandings, even to just the, the biblical reading that we've been doing for years and years, and we never even considered uh, may actually in, in them encapsulate and hold some more, some other meanings that are quite interesting as well. So that's in terms of starting with, um, with a little bit of what is the pilgrimage. Again, we're talking about arriving from all over the known world to the place uh, that is chosen. And now that we're talking about the times of the temple, clearly we're talking about Jerusalem. So here we have, um, and I hope that everything's switched okay, so you can actually see the city of Jerusalem. And we uh, are now looking from the end of the city of David at the old city 
Um, but really, the beginning of Jerusalem is what I'm showing you here. In other words, this is the very, very beginning. The city that David conquers is today not behind the walls of the old city, for example. So if we want to really understand what's going on here, um, let's jump straight in and actually show you another view of where we were standing just a little bit closer. These, for example, are the walls of Jerusalem from uh, the times of King David. In fact, probably from even a lot before the times of King David. So um, if I will zoom in right here, you're actually seeing the slanted wall is a Canaanite wall. Archaeologists are debating whether it's 3,600 years old. Perhaps it's only 3,300 years old. But the famous walls of Jerusalem that you're seeing today, for the most part, are ancient, but only rebuilt some 500 years ago. In other words, perhaps using old material, when you actually see the original stone in situ, in the site where it was actually located three and a half thousand years ago, for that, you have to come to the city of David. And here, by the way, you can actually see one of the guard towers um, on this wall. So when we're thinking about arriving in Jerusalem thousands of years ago, um, this is the main part of the city that people actually arrived in. And if we're already talking about that, maybe just to, in order for us to be able to use our imagination and to try to have an image in our heads of what Jerusalem would have looked like thousands of years ago, I guess I should say, um, in the times of the second temple, in the times of Christ, for example, Jerusalem is a city that uh, if we add the old city of today to the city of David, et cetera, it, it actually, by the way, triples the size of what we call today the old city. But in any event, then we're talking about something in the neighborhood of between 100,000 to 200,000 people in the city of Jerusalem. It's substantial. It's a lot of people. Um, we know from the Talmud and from the Mishnah and from the other sources that during the pilgrimage, the population of Jerusalem would actually double. So if you're a minimalist, that means that there is at least 200,000 people in the city of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. If you're a maximalist, by the way, you're probably looking at 400,000 people. Let's take a nice, uh, you know, compromising number, 150,000 people in the city of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago means that during a pilgrimage, we have three. 100,000 people in the city of Jerusalem. It is a lot, and it's quite impressive. Of course, every time we read about it in the Jewish sources of the Mishnah from the uh, uh, third century when it was compiled to the uh, sixth century, and then in the Talmud um, to follow, sorry, Mishnah was compiled in the third century, the Talmud that was compiled in the sixth century, uh, it is very important for the, for the sages, for the rabbis to mention that no matter what, nobody ever complained that uh, there wasn't enough room. In other words, the city of Jerusalem was able to welcome everyone in, which is in itself um, quite impressive. So we're seeing a little bit of the city of David over here. I want to show you a little bit more again in the area that we just saw. And this time, this photo is a, a little bit closer, but it also does something else. It actually uh, is a little bit lower than the top of the wall that you could see before, and the reason uh, we made sure to have this shot is because you're actually seeing a house, a typical, uh, you could say, Jerusalem house from about 2,000 years ago here. In other words, on the ruins of first temple period Jerusalem and the second temple period, uh, this wall, this Canaanite wall see, stopped being a defensive wall to the city of Jerusalem, and you're seeing a home here. By the way, it's a little hard to see, but if you watch where my cursor is, and this is a base of a column of the house. This is the second one. This is the third, and this right here is the fourth, and it has, uh, it, it is a typical type of Jewish architecture that we find a lot in Jewish times and not so much in other towns. It isn't a very practical way uh, to open your house in all directions as soon as you arrive. The reason is it's done is, is a question in itself. Perhaps it has to do 
with purity and impurity, which in Judaism is playing, of course, a big role. Um, but focus on where my cursor is right here. And you can actually see a stone. And we tried as best as we could to make sure that you can actually see this little hole that is in the center of it. And I hope you can all see it. But this used to be over here. And you're seeing a room that actually has this stone with the hole. And then a chute that goes down, I don't know, some uh, approximately six feet, almost five, five and a half, maybe six feet down into the ground. And the question is what it is. And the answer is, well, it is a toilet. So this is a very fancy uh, Jerusalem house. This is not a typical Jerusalem house. How do I know that it's a fancy house? Because this gentleman here had a toilet in his home um, when the Talmud will ask itself on Masechet Shabbat, there on, uh, there's a, on the tractate of Shabbat, there's a big debate on who's a rich man. That's how the uh, rabbis are starting the question. So what is the definition of wealth, right? How, how much do you actually need to have in your checking account for you to be considered a shield, a rich person in Hebrew? And uh, the first answer that you receive from all the uh, rabbis is, of course, well, whoever's happy with what they have, they are rich. But then the uh, rabbis continue and ask, OK, but for real, what is the definition of wealth? And, and the answer is, well, Rabbi Tarfun, one of the rabbis, they each have an answer. Rabbi Tarfun says, whoever's toilet is close to his table. In other words, if you've managed to have a toilet built in your home close to where you eat, then you are obviously wealthy. What does it take for us? We don't really understand what's the big deal to have a toilet in your home and your plumbing is sort of, you know, the, I think the building brick of Western society is to have indoor plumbing. But at the same time, uh, in antiquity, try to imagine what it actually demanded. It demanded that the city's water supply actually goes through your house. You are connected to the grid to the point that everything runs through your home. And that is absolutely huge. So now we have a definition of, of wealth. Now I told you that the toilet was at the top. We're not done talking about the toilet. There's a, one more thing I wanna tell you about it. And that is that uh, when the archeologists found it, they got so excited about it and they actually found it in situ. So today they had to drop it down, but they have excavated all the way to the bottom. And sure enough, found a lot of uh, organic material that was excavated. And within that organic material, they were still able to determine that from the type of bacteria that was found inside the organic matter, these people had a very similar diet to nomads. Why is that a big deal for us? Because nomads, for the most part, cannot live off their land. They are living off their sheep. In other words, they have a lot of dairy products in their, in their diet. They have a lot of meat that is introduced to their diet more than the average Joe who rarely ate meat. Um, clearly this person, however, is not a nomad. So what could he be? Well, one good explanation that we have is that he could be a Kohen, he could be a priest. Because if you're a priest in the temple, then when it is your turn to go and work in the temple, um, you come back from work every day and your wife is asking you as you return, How's your day at work, honey? And you say, oh, it's great. And then she's asking, what did you bring me? Because of every offering, not of all offerings, but of a lot of the offerings that were given at the temple, a part of the offering went on the altar and was sacrificed and later burnt and essentially goes to God. Another part goes to the priest and a third part from most of the offerings that were given by people of the type of Shlamin. Let's not talk about it too much. There's a lot of different kinds of offerings. That will take us a week to cover, but um, we know that definitely a portion of the uh, animal goes to the priest. In other words, the priest is that guy who has a nomadic diet. And here we have a house in the city of David, um, very, very close to the temple. And this guy has got a toilet of his own and it seems to be consistent with a Cohen's kind of diet. So very, very exciting things that are found here um, in the city of David, um, along the, what was once upon a time, the Canaanite wall. Here's just another view of that Canaanite wall, a little bit from a distance to really show you 
what we're talking about here. Um, if, you know, hopefully soon Israel will open and we'll all be able to come and visit. But what I also want you to notice, if we can get the other side, just on the opposite side, is that we are over the Kidron Valley. Now, uh, actually, funny enough, more for those who are more acquainted with the uh, New Testament than the Old Testament. The Old Testament mentions the Kidron a number of times. The New Testament mentions it many times. And we know that because the Kidron is the unofficial border of the ancient city of Jerusalem. You can actually see that drop here, which is quite important for us. The walls of Jerusalem throughout the ages, at least along the Eastern side, and we are now facing the East. In other words, somewhere here, we're already seeing um, Mount Olives, for example, outside the city of Jerusalem. So this is a real topographical border. By the way, 2000 years ago, it is approximately 30 meters. That's almost 100 feet deeper than what it is today. In other words, more of an obstacle than what we're actually seeing today. And this, this is very important for us. So when we see the Kidron, there's in fact quite a lot that we can say um, about it. And what's, what's fascinating is that here in the city of David, we can actually enter the Kidron. We do that from the top and through a very, very interesting shaft. Now, what you're seeing here is actually a combination of both the uh, natural work of just mother nature uh, cutting her way through the limestone. It's a, type of, uh, it's a type of geological phenomenon called karst. If you've heard of it before, you can see it in Europe and a lot of places. This is just water seeping through uh, hard rock and over time, the since water that comes from the rain is never just H2O from the lab. There's always a little bit of uh, acid there to actually melt down the rock. Um, so we, there was a crack there, but that crack was expanded and widened um, by people in antiquity who actually figured out a way to go to the Kidron without ever having to expose themselves. Now, what is it that they're looking for in the Kidron? They're looking for water. Water in the Kidron comes from a spring that is called the Gihon Spring. And this is a shaft that was actually found in the 19th century by the first British archaeologist who entered uh, that uh, area here in what is today called the village of Silwan or um, the city of David. And he found this uh, shaft that we're seeing right here. And when he saw this hole, it was very, very hard to take a photo of the shaft itself, but he saw this entrance and it goes all the way down into the valley, into the area of the Gihon Spring. He got very excited because as far as um, he was concerned, Charles Warren, of course, is the name of the uh, British archaeologist. As far as Warren was concerned, uh, he found the Sinor, which is the biblical word described to explain how David and his uh, soldiers actually entered the city of Jerusalem when he conquered it. So just to kind of remind you and print it a little bit in a time frame. So when Joshua enters the promised land, we're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of 1200 BC or BCE. And then only 200 years later, right around the year 1000, 1004, 1002, 998, if you insist, it doesn't matter. That is when um, David is actually uh, ruling as king. He's, of course, the second king of Israel after King Saul. And he's the first king from the line of Judah. Now, in the times of Saul, Saul's city is actually the uh, city of Bethel. Bethel is the capital of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin and Judah are neighbors. And... Um, in other words, every tribe has its own territory. This territory was already determined in the times of Moses in the desert. In other words, even before the conquest of the Holy Land began, they already divided the loot, if you will, amongst the tribes. There were Not everything happened exactly according to plan. The tribe of Dan didn't get everything that they were hoping for, and then Dan had to go up north and so on and so forth. But the important thing is that uh, the city of Jerusalem was simply sitting on the cusp 
between the two tribes, between the tribe of Benjamin, which is the, if you will, the early monarchy, and the tribe of Judah, which is the line of David, which is the later monarchy. And for 200 years since the times of Joshua, Jerusalem was, I dare say, ignored by uh, the ancient Israelites. They couldn't care less about it. They conquered everything around it, but not it. And if you look at the city of David, and we could even see that from the first uh, uh, shot that I showed you, we actually look down at the city of David from Mount Moriah, from the area of Temple Mount, and we look down at the city of David from Mount Olives, and we look down at the city of David from Mount Zion, and so on. So it's, 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 it's very well fortified, but it's not like, oh my God, we have to conquer the city. This was never on the must conquer list of the Israelites in the times of David, and immediately it makes you wonder, why is it so important for David to go ahead and conquer it? I think I already hinted the answer when I told you that it is sitting there on the cusp between the two cities. In other words, if we, let's, let's dwell on that for a minute or two, let's talk about this. If we actually talk about um, what is going on in the years when the Israelites are deciding to actually create a united monarchy to unite the tribes together to have a king for them and so on well Saul the first king if you recall the first uh thing that he does as king is he goes he takes a bull he carves it into 12 pieces he sends a piece to every one of the 12 tribes and he says you all better show up to the battle I have against the Philistines if not you'll end up like the bull I'll make steak out of you in other words there is a problem because the the divided tribal society isn't always working as one unit. And, and if there is a battle against the Philistines on the West, then perhaps the tribes on the East could say, not my problem. And that is concerning. And Saul has to go and carve a bull. David doesn't want to, he's, he's dealing with the exact same problem of a tribal society that isn't homogenous enough. But at the same time, he doesn't want to find himself carving bulls all the time and threatening people. So he's thinking, what can I unite the tribes around? And Jerusalem, more than anything else, simply because it is between two tribes, it is literally a city on the border between two tribes. Who does it belong to then? You could say it belongs to both. You could say it belongs to neither. Or you could say that it belongs to all tribes. It's a little bit like the federal line, right, between the, the states of the United States. Say the federal line is federal and it belongs to everyone. So the city of Jerusalem then, as far as David is concerned, he goes and conquers it. And immediately he invites Jews of all tribes to come to Jerusalem. And once you basically join the other tribes in Jerusalem, you've just created Jerusalem, D.C. This is your first, if you will, taxation without representation uh, of the Israelites. But everyone is there. Where are you on the pilgrimage? Oh, I'm in Jerusalem, of course. Why Jerusalem? Because it's my city. It doesn't belong to Judah. It doesn't belong to Benjamin. I'm not a guest there. I'm reminding you that David was already king, kind of his own state capital, his own tribe's capital in uh, the city of Hebron. And in Hebron, where the patriarchs and the matriarchs are buried, uh, David actually reigned for seven years from the capital of Judah over the whole kingdom. But if he wants to really create this united monarchy, he needs a glue. And the glue is Jerusalem. And of course, the next step is to go ahead and conquer this city. And David, who I remind you, is a shepherd from the city of Bethlehem, right? As a young boy, he knew every nook and cranny in the area. He knew that there is a secret passage. There's a way to enter the way the water comes out. And that is what we're seeing here. Now, I would like to actually show you the way into the water. So we have a number of these entrances here. One of them is just down here below. Let's see if we can just make it a little bit smaller. That is another shot of the shaft. Again, it doesn't show you all the way to the bottom. There are a lot of uh, archaeological debates over, is this in fact the way that David and his soldiers entered? But then as you can see, this goes further on. And here, we're already seeing the entrance into the water. And so we think that we found the exact way that David entered. By the way, another option is this tunnel. Line. So we actually have two tunnels. One of them is wet and one of them 
is dry. So we call this the dry tunnel or the Kennedy tunnel. And the one that you saw earlier is we know later that one is Hezekiah's tunnel. So let's just show you that one one more time. Sorry, I went in the wrong direction. So this is the Kennedy tunnel, perhaps the, the one that David used and later went up the shaft. And this one here is a little bit later uh, from a later story here in Jerusalem when the uh, city of Jerusalem is under siege by the Assyrians. And in the times of King Zedekiah, uh, he actually uh, moves the water, doesn't move the start of the water. He has no control of the spring. This was already there in the times of Zedekiah, uh, but he moves it on to, uh, to the southern side of the city of David. So, so Hezekiah is, is, is doing that, and it's kind of a big deal. This is already a bit lower. And by the way, this is when you come out of the water tunnel. The water tunnel is only about 1,800 feet long or so. And still, it is an architectural marvel because two groups and figures were actually working towards one another. In fact, let me even show it to you right now. And actually see if earlier we started our tour more or less around here, okay? And we were able to look at the southern wall of Temple Mount and the Kidron Valley that is below. Well, right around here, we entered the tunnel. And the tunnel ended pretty much around here at this pool. And so these two groups of diggers, and we'll come back to this map a couple of times, these two group of diggers basically managed to meet at the halfway point, um, which is what is uh, very, very impressive. So let's just have another look at what's happening here. Let me just full screen this again. These are remains of the same wall that we saw earlier, that same Canaanite wall just further down along the way in the city of David. So let's try to kind of, oh, here we go. Wonderful, another good shot of this same wall. By the way, here, what you're actually seeing, I don't know if you can tell, there's a bit of a radial shape to this. This is somewhat of a circle along this wall. Once upon a time, this was actually a tall tower, which kind of had two functions in it. It was both a guard tower along the wall, but these little cavities that you're seeing, these, these holes were actually uh, dove pots. And so they are uh, towers where pigeons were raised for the most part uh, for food and perhaps a little bit for sacrifice as well. We know, for example, that every time a woman would give birth and she would actually have to give to two turtle doves, for example, to the temple as offering as well. So we have um, a little bit of the uh, wall, the same one that we saw earlier, but further in. Eventually, from the spring where we saw earlier, the Gihon started, it actually ended up in a large pool. And that is what you're seeing here. That is the Shiloh pool or the Silwan pool. Um, it is mentioned both Old as well as New uh, Testament. Um, Jesus is healing the blind man down here in this pool. Unfortunately, the, our ability here is only to see one side of the pool. In other words, if this is a square-shaped pool, then you can see we're seeing the original stones here on the floor, um, but we're only seeing one side of it. There is a large garden that you can see the trees that are on it and the archeologists simply aren't allowed to take down all this dirt and to actually dig the rest of the garden that is here. In this rare case, it's not about people who live in this garden. There are no homes or anything like that. What we actually have here um, is Greek Orthodox uh, territory, and because the city of David or the village of Silwan is so uh, contested politically, they don't want to take a side in what's happening there today. Um, but perhaps it gives us the hope that one day we'll be able to properly dig this pool. It is without a doubt the most important pool 
in uh, ancient Jerusalem. Here's just another shot of it. I just want to show you from a little bit higher. And what's great about this angle is that you can actually, or we should be able, here we are, to see that how the water, where we saw it starting, actually found its way into this pool. Now, we're talking about the festival of Sukkot. So to kind of fully understand this, I'm showing you a little bit about pilgrimage and a little bit about the city of Jerusalem, but I think we are finally able to sort of start connecting the dots and to show you both what we have recently been discovering in the city of David, but also talk about something that was happening here in this school 2000 years ago, only on Sukkot. And that is what we like to call Nisu Hamayim, or the libation of uh, water. So let's just go over the regalim one last time to make sure we're all on the same page. We have three of these uh, regalim, these events, the pilgrimages. The uh, Let's start with the other two, with the festival of Passover. And Passover always will fall at the beginning of spring. In fact, without going too much into the details there, it is worth knowing that today we have a mathematical equation in the Jewish calendar, which is a combination of a solar as well as a lunar calendar. And over the course of 19 years, we'll finish a cycle, which is by the way, astronomically true as well. But then there's also, the point is that we don't need to kind of scratch our heads and think, hey, are we leaping the year this year? Are we not? We're not talking about an extra day in February. We're talking about a 13th month. We're talking about adding a whole other month to the year. Now, today, we don't think at all. We had Hillel, which Hillel is another question, but Hillel is the name. There are many great rabbis that own that name, Hillel. Probably it was Hillel II who actually uh, came to us with the mathematical equation that allowed us to have a, a, a calendar that will essentially work for all eternity. So I know when my bar mitzvah will be from the week that I'm born, I don't need to wait for uh, some Jewish court to confirm or deny that indeed there will be a leap year and so on. It wasn't this way. Why? Because in the roots of Judaism, uh, Agriculture played a huge role in day-to-day -day life and also in the special events of life. In other words, the celebration of Passover is also a celebration of spring. And the rabbis went out somewhere if Passover usually will fall around April. So that means that in the end of February, the uh, rabbis of the Sanhedrin, of the Jewish courts, will go out to the wheat and the barley fields to measure the height of the wheat and the height of the barley. And if they think that spring is coming, then it's business as usual. And if they think that the winter is too long and we're not quite there yet, then they will leap the year and add another month. And what determined it? The wheat, or I should say the season. In other words, the seasons are intertwined with our agricultural day-to-day. -day. And back then, remember, this is like 99% of the people work in agriculture because everyone raised their own crops, at least to a certain degree. Everyone does at least something. So we have uh, Passover, and that is a festival that we uh, essentially bless our crops. We have Shavuot, Pentecost, um, which is essentially a celebration of end of spring and beginning of uh, summer, we actually come to the temple and we bring as offering uh, the best of our fruit. We already tied them up and we sort of made sure that they are the ones that are sent over to the temple. We're very excited about the ability to bring the best of the best cream of the crop over to the temple of Jerusalem. And then there is Sukkot. And I mean, you guys look around you, Go outside, check the weather, fall is coming. Today, we are expecting what we call the yore. Yore is the first uh, rain of the year. And when you live in this part of the Mediterranean, that actually happens. We're not yet, we haven't had rain in months. This isn't uh, the UK here where you could have 
uh, rain in August is just another regular day. We don't get rain in August unless something very peculiar has happened. Um, we're usually waiting for September, end of September, early October for the Yoreh. And in the Jewish prayer book, by the way, um, in just another couple of days, we are going to start to ask for rain to come, which is also interesting because the rabbis have realized they were a little bit late to the party and we should have asked it a few days earlier. Why are we not asking for rain? Although the season has already started. In other words, why don't we call upstairs and ask God, hey, we want rain now? Because we know that there are people who are on a pilgrimage and they haven't arrived home yet. So we better wait for them to get home and then ask for rain so they don't have to, you know, schlep all their kids and all their belongings and actually uh, be stuck in the rain. So we're waiting a couple of days specifically for the people who are on a pilgrimage. But in the end of the day, what is unique about Sukkot is that this is the beginning of fall and it is the uh, festival of the Asif, which in itself is brilliant because the word Asif uh, means also agriculturally as well as socially to gather, okay? What are you doing? Oh, I'm Asifing my, uh, my dates and I'm also Asifing my people and we're, we're all gathering. We gather together, so we're gathering fruit but really we're dealing with water. And if you recognize this, um, this is uh, the, the picture that I put here is from the synagogue in Beit Alpha. Uh, again, we have a saying in Hebrew, many pencils were broken. Just writing about this uh, very, very interesting uh, um, uh, zodiac that you see here because it comes from the middle of the synagogue. So in the middle of the synagogue, we're finding the star signs, which is fine. Okay, here's the lion, here's Leo. And here's Virgo, and they're all here. But what's up with the uh, sun and the moon and the quadriga with the four horses? This is probably Helios, the sun god. What is he doing in a synagogue? Uh, we'll see. Maybe if, if I'll be called for another lecture, we can we can one once uh, we'll find the time to talk about these. But these four ladies are what's really fascinating because, and they're supposed to even wear the correct attire for uh, the season. So we actually have the four seasons here. This, it says here in Hebrew, the times of Tishrei, which means this is our month right now in the Jewish calendar, Tishrei is the first month. I'm reminding you that it, it means that we are only now starting uh, the year. And of course, Sukkot is all part of what we like to call the high holidays. And it all begins with Rosh Hashanah, which is Aleph, the first, of the month of Tishrei. And so we are starting the fall and we are really commemorating and celebrating that and asking for water. So let's talk a little bit about the libation of water. And for that, we need to talk about the Mishnah in Masechet Sukkah, the tractate of Sukkah. And we need to understand what actually happened. So first of all, when we talk about libation of water, the very, very beginning of libation of water, or in Hebrew, nisuch amayim, and the word in Hebrew is quite important. We see the, the, the earliest hint to it already in the book of Genesis, probably in the same place. And we've mentioned that place. We called it Beit El, if you recall, that is the uh, capital city of the tribe of Benjamin. We even know the ancient name of Beit El before it was called Beit El, which is Luz. The word Bayit in Hebrew is a house and El in Hebrew is God. So this is the house of God. And that is because that is where Jacob has his famous dream with the uh, angels going down, up and down the ladder. And, and probably it's also the place where he battled with the uh, angel, the angel of Esau, his uh, twin brother, and, uh, of course, ended up enjoying a new name that was given to him. Remember, Jacob means the one who uh, grabbed onto the heel of his uh, twin brother, right? Esau came first, and Jacob was holding onto the heel of Esau, and, uh, or Esau. And, of course, what happens um, after that night of battling, when the, they're both locked in that gridlock, and the angel cannot leave, and he needs to go at dawn and pray, and according to the commentary on the uh, Torah, the Midrash is describing this beautiful story of how the angel is saying, let me go, I need to go and pray to God. And 
And of course, uh, and Jacob says, uh, I need a, I need a, a, a something back from you. And he says, whatever you need. And he tells him, oh, give me a new name. So there's sort of a, an expansion of the biblical description there. And, he's, and then, of course, we read this in the Bible as well, when he tells him, well, from here on out, your name will not be Jacob, the one who grabbed onto the heel of his brother, but Yisra El, Israel. Yisra means to combat the battle, and El means angel, right, or God. They're both, in this case, getting the name El. Um, and so Yisrael, Israel really means the one who combated with God, and in, in the case of Jacob, prevailed and, and, and earned a new name out of it. And of course, the next day after these events are taking place, and this actually show, appears to us twice in the book of Genesis, I'm just going to read from uh, 35, which is after the first story that I told you, that the angel was going up and down the ladder. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he walked with him even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. So this is the libation of water, but as you can see, there is libation of oil and libation of wine, and is this libation of everything, because this is the important part here. What we're actually doing is we're taking something and we are elevating it. We are giving it an aliyah, right? We are ascending it. And how do we do that? Well, one way is to simply say a blessing, which we are also doing while we're doing it. But the trick is sometimes, and I think this is important to understand, that certain events, days, memories are not tangible things. And it's very, very hard to sort of pass the meaning. So uh, if, if Jews on a Friday will have chidush, right? First, they will bless the wine and then they will bless the bread. I think it's important to remember that those things perhaps are secondary. What we're actually blessing is the day. It is just that days are not a tangible thing. So how do we bless the day? By taking wine, which is very tangible, blessing the wine, but also adding a second blessing to the day and then drinking it. This wine, once blessed, is in a different place than regular wine. I can drink a glass of wine. I haven't blessed or a glass of water. I didn't bless or anything. This water is just regular water. I'm done with it. I pour it. If this water went through the process of blessing, I have now put these other spiritual properties into it. And from here on out, they are at a different place. They're at a different level. And that is important to understand. So let's read a little bit from the mission. We got time. Good. So with regard to the rite of water libation performed in the temple during the festival, how was it performed? So the Mishnah, which I remind you, is already compiled in the early days of the third century. In other words, the year 70 and the destruction of the temple is long gone. And it's all at this point orally passed, father to son, rabbi to student. They actually need to be reminded already of how it was like less than 200 years ago. But that's five, six, seven generations ago. So one would fill a golden jug with the capacity of three logs. By the way, three logs is about a, a, a liter, a liter and a half. So let's say a quarter of a gallon to perhaps a third of a gallon of, let's continue reading, with water from the Silwam pool, which we already know where it is. And we just saw the picture. So from here, this is where they're taking the water from. This is what's happening. When those who went to bring the water reached the gate of the water, so let's understand what's happening now. We have from this pool a road, and this is the most updated, and I, I could tell you, your ear worked very hard on us even being able to take these photos. Rules were bent, possibly broken for us to be able to enter. Uh, this is a tiny little fragment of this street, of the Pilgrim Street. I want, I mean, I don't know how much it is clear or how much you can appreciate, but this looks amazing, I think, in terms of the quality and the cutting and the uning of the stones. Some of these stones weigh over a ton, each stone. You know the saying, they don't build them this way anymore, but you can actually see how impressive uh, this street is. And this is today under the homes of people who live in uh, the village of Silwan or in the city of David. Unfortunately, all we have here from side to side is somewhere in the neighborhood of 
six, seven feet in the widest points, it's about 10 feet, but it's it actually an original ranged about 150 feet from side to side. How do I know? Because there are two shots here, one side of the street and another side of the street. And you saw two streets, it's not the same one. We just, there are two excavations. Unfortunately, they could only show one here and one here. Everything that is in the middle, if my head is the middle of the street, unfortunately that cannot be excavated. Um, but we found the same exact street with the height of the stairs corresponding on either side of this 150 meters wide street. This, by the way, is just another corner of the pool. In reality, this is what I showed you earlier. This side here, this is basically a, a wall that they put on the other side of this, uh, of this uh, Greek Orthodox garden to show you what it would look like complete. And of course, don't forget to notice that the uh, walls of the city of Jerusalem, and of course, the antiquity walls, this is just to kind of give us the feeling, are allowing the pool to stay in. In other words, that earlier story that we talked about when Hezekiah, the king, is diverting the water from the Kidron Valley deeper into the city, he's moving it here for safety and security reasons. What you're seeing here is the original floor of Ben and the way in. So let's kind of go back to our libation story. Here is the currently excavated areas. You're seeing, again, a lot of what's nowadays being explored. You can see this is during excavation, and uh, we kind of snuck in to see how are things looking like. Uh, so that's what you're seeing here. But let me just show you again that map from previously, because now it becomes again important. If we are here, then this is the Pilgrim's Road. That's what you're seeing. Of course, it will go all the way. These are the current walls of the city of Jerusalem. The ancient walls went along here. In other words, here are the ancient walls. These are the 500-year-old walls. You can ignore them, I suppose, and they take us up here. So let's kind of continue with this. So the golden jug with the capacity of three logs with water from this little one pool, bring it, reach the gate of the water. So called because the water of the libation was brought through this gate leading to the temple courtyard. They sounded a tekia, sounded a terua, and sounded another tekia as an expression of joy. Let's just have a look for a minute at our, uh, here is a little model of the temple in Jerusalem, and you can actually see that right around here, we have a gate on the south called the water gate. So this was the gate that they entered. Just to clarify this one more time, here we are. This is the south. In other words, this is the east. And so this is the south, this is the east, we know it was the southeastern gate that was called the water gate. And this is the road that led them in to that southeastern gate that would probably be right around here in antiquity. Sorry, right around here. In antiquity. So the entered, let's just go back to our passage, to our reading. Here we are uh -huh. smaller again and continue reading the Mishnah here, uh, no, yes, good. So uh, they, uh, so now they're they're playing their trumpets, Tekia, Terua, Tekia, as an expression of joy. By the way, here you can actually see uh, a recreation of what it would have looked like with some of the other gates that are here as well. And you can see uh, the trumpets, the trumpet and shofar were actually used, but uh, they were both there. And the priest ascended uh, the ramp of the altar, and there was limestone basins, but they would blacken due to the wine. Now, this is actually quite important because libation of uh, wine was done in the temple on a regular basis. What is unique for tabernacles, what is unique for Sukkot, is the libation of water. And of course, that is because of the season. We want to ask uh, for rain. So let's just find. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, so 
Rabbi Yehuda said they were limestone. Uh, okay. And due to the wine, it, they therefore looked silver. And the two basins were uh, perforated at the bottom with two thin uh, perforated nose-like uh, crustaceans. One of the basins used for the wine libation had a perforation that was broad and one used for the water libation had a perforation that was thin so that the flow of both water and the wine, which would not have the same vis uh, viscosity, would conclude simultaneously. So what is happening here, we need to imagine, I'm carrying, I'm now the high priest, of course, I'm carrying the uh, uh, quarter of a gallon, a third of a gallon of water. And what I'm about to do is I'm about to pour it into essentially two funnels. One funnel that is a little bigger and one funnel that is a little thinner in terms of the ending. Um, so that both liquids will pour down. The basin to the west of the altar was for water, and the basin uh, to the east of the altar was for wine. So there, and this is something that is fascinating to know, that on the altar, there is actually these uh, tubes and pipes, and on each corner, on each horn of the altar, the horns of the altar, a place of refuge, uh, apparently a place that also holds some architectural importance, because there are uh, these, these pipes that go down below the altar and they're called shitin and they're fascinating. The word shitin is rare in the Bible as well. And they're, they're very, very uh, important because they are not just uh, a basin to accumulate uh, the water and the wine. And by the way, also the blood of the uh, sacrifices. All of those things are now, if you recall, uh, also you know, have, have received certain properties of spirituality and they're holy. So what is happening there is, is another question in itself. And um, it's, let's see, da, 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 this, here comes the important part for us, for the concept, uh, okay, he fulfilled his obligation, his failure to pour the libation from the uh, prescribed location does not qualify the libation after the fact. Rabbi Yehuda says, the basin of the water libation was not uh, that large. Rather, one could pour, would pour the water with a vessel that had the capacity of one log. This is less uh, important on all eight days of the festival and not only seven. And the appointee said to the one pouring the water, and here's the important part, sorry, uh, into the silver ba uh, basin, Raise your hand so that his actions would be visible. This is uh, sort of a very interesting uh, thing that the Mishnah is telling us. Uh, we do not trust that the priest is actually going to perform the ritual as he should. Well, apparently we don't. Why? Because as one time, a Sadducee priest intentionally poured the water on his feet as the Sadducees did not accept the oral tradition requiring water libation. So let's just dwell on this for a minute. Even in this celebration of Sukkot, when all Jews gather in the temple, there are still many, many colors and names and sects and types of Jews. And uh, we know that 2000 years ago, we have uh, Sadducees, but we also have Pharisees. The modern day Orthodox, or not just Orthodox, old Jews, trace themselves back uh, to, to uh, Pharisee Jews simply because they were the majority and they're the ones who lasted uh, through the ages. But I could tell you that uh, Sadducees uh, 2,000 years ago ran the show, okay? Let's put it in a, in a simple, clear way. Uh, the majority of, of the uh, priests were Sadducees, majority of the people who uh, had money uh, apparently were Sadducees, according to the description in the Mishnah and the Talmud. And so the Sadducees are a very, very important group in Judaism. And the main difference between Sadducees and Pharisees is their approach towards uh, the oral tradition of Judaism. In other words, as far as they were concerned, the Sadducees, there are 613 commandments in the five books of Moses. There's... Uh, 200 and something rather uh, uh, do's, and the rest are don'ts. There are more don'ts than do's. That's just Judaism for you. And, um, and that's it. 
beyond that, everything that is tradition is maybe lovely and wonderful, but it is not mandatory and it is not part of the day-to-day -day ritual, for example. So it, since the libation of water does not appear black on white in the five books of Moses, uh, as far as the Sadducees were concerned, they didn't do it. And this one time, the Mishnah tells us that Sadducee priest intentionally poured the water on his feet as the Sadducees did not accept the oral tradition requiring water libation. It is not in the Torah. And the result, I'm reading the last uh, verse from the Mishnah on Sukkah, and in their rage, all the people, remember, majority of the people are Pharisees. High priest may be a Sadducee, and he and all his rich friends are Sadducees, but in the rage, all the people pelted him with their etrogim. And they killed him with those etrogim that were in their hands, this is the uh, the citrus that is uh, today at least known as the etrog. We could have had another, a whole other lecture on what is in fact the etrog. Is it that? Is it something else? But um, we see that even in this holiday, clearly there were big arguments. By the way, the thing that is unique to Sukkot is Simchat uh, Beit uh, Hashoivah. This uh, this holiday. Um, that includes the libation of water receives a new name in Hebrew, the joy, the celebration of uh, the house of Shoeva means to draw water. So the drawing of water, the libation of water is sort of a, a practice, a ritual, a practice that receives uh, the extra uh, adjective, I'm not sure it's adjective, the description, the joy. Why is it so important to tell us to be joyous? Why is it so important to celebrate it in a way that everyone sees and everyone knows about? Well, exactly because of those Sadducees who don't even want to have the celebration at all, it is important for us to make sure that they know that we are doing it and that they are wrong and we are right. And guess what? We are going to be extra joyous when we perform this ritual. So that is something that is unique. Um, to the libation of water. Here you can even see the priest coming into the water gate. And this is happening, by the way, at dawn. So the, the drawing of the water happened just before dawn. And they all walk up with holding uh, um, uh, lights in their hands. The, the young priests are all carrying them in their hands. And you can actually imagine them in a long procession. I mean, this is huge. This is from the pool here to the water gate is more than half the size of, uh, of ancient Jerusalem. It is approximately the length of the old city of today. So it's, it's uh, almost a mile of a walk um, that these people are going at night, again, holding torches in their hands. So that's uh, something special that went on, uh, on Sukkot, on the Shoeva celebration. Let's just actually see what happens when we come out. I'm going to just take us out because we've already seen this. Okay, this is another photo, by the way, of the small pool where the water goes to. This is just worth knowing that today, because that area that you saw of the Greek Orthodox, unfortunately, is not um, an active pool. The water some 1,500 years ago just was stopped a bit earlier than the ancient pool. And you can actually see this. It's a Byzantine pool again. This is directly below the, uh, the pilgrimage road. So we found the pilgrimage road. But what's even, I don't want to say more impressive, but also very impressive is that this is the sewer tunnel that is below that pilgrimage road. Again, just goes to show the uh, level of sophistication here in the city of Jerusalem, in the city of Jerusalem, 2,000 years ago, uh, very, very sad to say that also, amongst other things that are found in this uh, in this in this uh, path, we are finding some uh, water reservoir. These are small cisterns that are again below the street, and it's it's worth knowing that it's also the place probably where where Jewish refugees at uh, the year 70, when the temple was destroyed, um, actually went and hid uh, from the Romans. Unfortunately, most of them were captured 
uh, but uh, but and we can still find it. It's like looking at the heart because you can still find uh, certain precious belongings that were hidden. Um, below the main streets in Jerusalem where people are hiding in the sewer knowing that the Romans are coming. The fascinating thing is that when you kind of come out of this sewer tunnel, you can actually see here the uh, base of Temple Mount. So the temple is at the top of Temple Mount, but what you're actually seeing right now is the very, very base of it. This is important to understand because here is the ancient uh, street. We are now below the ancient street and I'm just sorry, I have to admire the Herodian work of uh, cutting and uning the stones that nobody will see that are below the streets. Just look at how nice they are. And even here, he made sure to make the frame around the stones and so on. And you can, by the way, see some people are putting their notes inside. When you come out, you can already see the street from 2000 years ago. Amongst other things, there are many, many. Uh, of the mikvaot here, these are Jewish ritual pools that are just basically adjacent to the uh, walls of Temple Mount. All this, by the way, is the Western wall of Temple Mount. And behind here, just on the other side of this wooden bridge, I don't know if you can see it clearly or not, is the uh, area where uh, Jews go and pray. So it's, they're both the Western wall, this is just a more, uh, let's call it a southern section of it. So these are the original floors. We just walked from the sewer and came out here. Again, look at how beautiful the quality of the floor tiles. And you can see the shops that were here, just to kind of put you on the map. So we walked here, we are now here on the southern section of the western wall but the plaza is here so just on the other side of this wooden bridge that we have right here so we are now kind of focusing on this area because this area after 1967 was excavated really gave us an opportunity to understand how things used to look like on the main streets of jerusalem and in a moment i'm actually going to swing us over from the west to uh the south Let's go straight to the southern wall. And here we are. Now it's just another shot of the west, my bad. Although it's a very nice one, especially because, let's see if we can see this or not. This, for example, is the stone. I don't know if you can tell the angle that was actually originally over here at the top of the western wall where it connects with the southern wall. And it's not even exactly the original height that it was, but it was about 150 feet high. So it was quite impressive. Um, and at the top, there was a turret where they could actually uh, call people from, invite them over or let them know that Shabbat has started or the holiday started. The, this is already the Southern wall of Temple Mount. And here you can actually see the original staircases that led the people into the temple. And here, this is the hardest thing to see, but this, not the cornice here below, but above it, these are two huge stones. They're pretty much the only thing that is left from the original entrance into the temple. This is how the pilgrims actually enter the temple. You can see both here, the staircase, and a corresponding section over here. It didn't last completely, but a lot of it did, and we have Three arches, I'm not sure they are clear to see that are over here. I think I might have another Southern wall. Uh, that should be great. So hopefully, A, you can see the staircase here very well because it's much closer. And also you can see what I was talking about. It wasn't this beautiful cornice over here, but it's actually what's above it. These are the original, uh, stones from the original entrance to the temple. You can see the lower row here, there again are the, uh, what's left of the southern wall. And over here are the three arches. Again, they didn't come out uh, very well, but you get the idea. They are right here. Let's see if this shot maybe got them a little bit better. 
Um, let's try. We only have a little bit of them. Yeah, here we are. So these are the three block entrances. These are not the ones, by the way, from the times of the temple, but again, to show you on the map, it would have been right around here. Here's the staircase and the two entrances, three here and two that are here. By the way, we even know that when people entered uh, the temple on pilgrimage, so they entered from here and they came out from here. There was an entrance, three gates, and there were exits on the other side. And of course, everyone's expected to go on the correct path. If you're entering, you're not gonna enter through the exit. And if you're exiting, you're not gonna exit through the entrance, except there were people who did. Two types of people. The one type is anyone who is mourning. And if you were mourning, when you entered, even on a pilgrimage, you went against traffic, against hundreds of thousands of people that are going in the opposite direction. Now, why would you do that? If you're mourning, then you have performed something called kuriya, which means you took the edge of your garment and you ripped it. And now everyone knows that you are essentially on your shiva. You're sitting shiva, in your case, you're not sitting because you still go to the temple, which is fascinating in itself. But all those people, you know, they, they go against you in the traffic and they know you lost a loved one. And that's their opportunity to offer their condolences. So anybody who entered the temple uh, and was mourning was receiving condolences from whoever went out and vice versa. And the other type of Jewish person who actually entered from here, just to be clear, you entered from here, but you came out here. So there are these underground passages that only took you out here. This whole area that is today the mosque was back then called the Royal Stoa, consider it the Bank of Israel. So the entrances and the exits came out here. Um, and the other type of person is that person who is excommunicated, who is shunned by his own community. That's why you call cherem in Hebrew, or nidui. And these are people who obviously did something terrible that they don't even talk to them in their town. They're the Bernie Madoffs, if you will, of their times. And nobody wants to talk to them. And those people still have to come and gather together with everyone on the pilgrimage. And not only that, they don't get to go low key and just blend with the rest of the people. No, they are expected to go against traffic. And they also had a special blessing for them. And that was a blessing that basically was wished, people wished them that may they and their communities find a way to reconcile their differences and actually reconnect together. So that was another thing that was unique um, on the pilgrimage as well in terms of entrance and exits. So another interesting thing about that as well. So this is again, we're in the Southern area and I'm getting to the last part of my, uh, of my short lecture with you. So I'm going to skip ahead into the key drone directly. First of all, here's another top shot, a last shot of the city of David, but mainly to show you how far the key drone stretched. And then the other thing that I really want to do is to basically take us down into the valley itself. So as you're making your way down, starting to go down that uh, staircase, you can actually see the Mount of Olives is on the opposite side. You can see the tombstones that are just dotting it all over. Mainly, you know, when you talk about the Mount of Olives, it's uh, amongst her guides, it's common to talk about the Jewish mountain on the south and the Christian mountain is on the north, but that's re only relevant to the summit because uh, here, of course, you can see the uh, Church of the Agony or the Church of All Nations or the Church of Gethsemane. So this is Gethsemane and look at the uh, uh, olive trees over here. And then you've got the Convent of Mary Magdalene and uh, the Church of the Ascension. They're all here. Down below, you're actually seeing an ancient Jewish cemetery. This is a beautiful ancient Jewish cemetery here uh, in general, burial in, or I should say on Mount Olives is, is ongoing for the past 2,800 years or so. And at the very, very bottom of the valley, we have some of the oldest, not the oldest, by the way, we, the oldest, again, like I said, go back to the second temple period. So we have here 
uh, some beautiful monolithic tombs. This is the tomb of Zechariah. This is the tomb of the Chazir family, not Chazir, but Chazir, which if you read in the uh, book of Chronicles is one of the priest families that actually operated in the temple. And behind this uh, uh, tree, we even have the most beautiful of the monuments of the uh, mountain, and that is the tomb of Absalom. So first we actually, I think, have Zechariah here. Let's just zoom out so we can see a little bit of Zechariah's tomb, a corner of it here, and the Chazir uh, family plot, which is here. We, I can take us closer so we can see the triglyphs and we can see the, the decorations that are still here, 2,000 years old. But let's just make, first of all, the effort to find, just make sure it's easier to draw top shot. No, let's just skip ahead to, here we are, Absalom. And look at this. So again, monolithic, perhaps not the roof, or not perhaps not the roof, but everything else was cut from uh, the bedrock itself. And Absalom is, of course, the son of David who uh, rebelled against him. Zechariah that we saw earlier is a bit more of a tricky story there. Which uh, Zechariah specifically are we talking about? Is it the Zechariah, Zechariah, the son of Brachia, or is it uh, the son of Yehoiada? And there is a difference uh, between the two. I just want to show you something fascinating that I found here. This is the monolithic, and this is monolithic completely, the tomb of Zechariah. So it's one stone, number one, which is, again, already beautiful, um, but it includes even the area of the roof. And then all the who's and who's of Jerusalem of the past 200, 300 years, by the way, are buried here next to Zechariah. I just want to show you, just here we are. Skip to this after libation. Okay, good. Uh, this is something fascinating that I found while uh, I was actually doing this lecture. I was just, you know, preparing a little bit. And I found this on Matthew, on Matthew 23. And it was fascinating to me because I remember as an archaeology student in Barlan University, uh, we actually talked quite a lot about uh, these royal tombs or these monumental tombs. Royal already suggests we know that there is a royal inside and we don't know nothing about who's inside. And as a student, I remember this was one of those times when they talked about the anachronistic problem of dating and then uh, taking folklore. And it all kind of mixes up together because the style of the tombs, those monolithic tombs that we, you saw right now, is in the Greek. Uh, style. A little Roman influences, perhaps even, which only makes it later, but you cannot date it to the times of Absalom, the son of King David. David lived 3,000 years ago, and everything about the tomb of his son shouts 2,000 years ago, and the same thing happens with Zechariah. So we actually had um, there's a problem there, and I, I remember there are a number of uh, solutions that were offered, but nobody actually ever offered me this solution. Uh, that I just happened to find here on Matthew 23. And, uh, and this is the woe to you, the oilachem. In Hebrew, it's, it's even, it translates better. I went with the, uh, uh, the, the New American uh, standard because uh, King James was even worse to be able to read. But, uh, but you could see where in this case, in Matthew, uh, the, the focus of the attention of the criticism is to the Pharisees, the hypocrites. For you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Now, I'll skip ahead. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. This is, of course, the, the, the prophecy that Jesus is, you know, he, he sees as it's manifesting with them, of course. Um, some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge with your, in your synagogues and prosecute them from city to city, say, uh, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous uh, bloodshed on earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel 
that the blood of Zechariah, the son of Raphia, who will be murdered between the temple and the altar. This tomb here is the tomb of Zechariah, although it, and I added here, Zechariah, the son of Yehoiada, or Zechariah, the son of Raphia, they are 250 years apart, both of which are prophets. Uh, Yehoiada is actually the first one, and we know that in the times of a king of Judah called Yoash, Yoash enjoyed the help of Yehoiada, who was the high priest as well as his main advisor, um, and he took his consult throughout his life. And when Yehoiada died, the uh, the son Zechariah took his place, and when he went to Yoash and he told him how bad he's behaving, um, then we read in the Bible how he is killed by Yoash. So there, that's one story. The other is the story of Brachia. His story, again, also not entirely clear, but he is also killed. Um, what's amazing, by the way, is that the story doesn't end there, but it actually continues on and describes that when the Nebuzardan, who is, this is in the uh, scroll of Eicha, uh, Lamentation, I believe, right? Uh, in English. On, on Eicha, we have a, an Eicha Rabbah. So we have a commentary like the Midrash, also for, for the book of, of Lamentations. And there is a description there that when the first temple was destroyed, uh, Nebuzardan, who was the head of the army, he is called, he is mentioned in the, uh, in the Old Testament, he's called Rav Tabachim, which means the main slaughter, the slaughter of all slaughters. And when he entered the temple, he saw the blood of Zachariah that was still bubbling. So for years and years after he was murdered, that prophet, his blood was still bubbling on the ground. Now, I only found a Harab in, in Hebrew. I couldn't find it translated to English. This should be a project for someone. But I got to tell you that it's a horrible story of how uh, Nebuzardan, the slaughter of all slaughters, asked the people, what is this blood bubbling on the floor? And the and it's not just anywhere on the floor. I found a, a, a mention in the Midrash that it wasn't on the floor where people celebrated. It wasn't on the floor where they did, uh, you know, libation of water. It was inside the area that was reserved for priests because no one is supposed to enter there. And that's where they killed them. And uh, they told him, oh, it's just from offerings. It's bubbling here. We don't know. And he went and he brought animals and he slaughtered them and he tried to appease the, wine, the, the blood and stop it from bubbling and it didn't work. And he said, you're gonna have to tell me the truth. Tell me what happened. And they told him, oh, this is the blood of Zechariah. We killed him. We shouldn't have killed him. And his blood will not rest. And he said, I will make his blood rest. And he goes and he starts bringing young priests. And he eventually brought 80,000, according to the Midrash, 80,000 young priests that are slaughtered, their bodies are slaughtered on the blood of Zechariah, and the blood does not stop. And he brings the Sanhedrin, the head of the Jewish high council, the Sanhedrin Hagdola, and he slaughtered all of them on the blood of Zechariah, and it wouldn't stop. And he brought the small Sanhedrin, what's left after all the sages are killed, there's another council of other 70 that will replace them, and he slaughtered them all, and even then the blood would not stop. And finally, Nebuzardan, that slaughter, looked up to the sky and said, Zechariah, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to slaughter all of your people? And the blood stopped. So that's the story of Zechariah's uh, tomb. And that's the story of Zechariah and the blood of Zechariah. And an anachronistic uh, problem that was solved because... Uh, here we have a possible explanation. 2,000 years ago, the blood, uh, sorry, the, the people of Jerusalem go through the effort of actually uh, redoing the uh, tombs, both of the kings and of the prophets. And here we have an explanation why the uh, tomb of Zechariah or the tomb of, of Absalom, although we said we have a problem, they don't belong architecturally, well, now we, we see that the book of Matthew tells us 
the, the people of Jerusalem, the Pharisees of Jerusalem, actually went through the trouble of glorifying them. And Jesus is telling them, do you think you're any better than those people? Well, you're not. And just because I cannot finish with the story of murder and blood and, you know, Zechariah is now getting a, uh, you know, it, I turned him into some kind of a blood mongering. I don't know what. So let's go with the the, the Zechariah of the son of Brachia. But by the way, there is a book of Zechariah in the Bible. It's worth to know that that's the main reason why uh, the numbers don't add up because the Jews count only 24 books in the Old Testament that I've been around. Christians to tell me, what are you talking about? Of course, there are more. And I said, oh, no, we take 12 prophets, smush them into one, call it the 12. Um, one of the 12 is Zechariah, the son of Brachia. And it actually uh, said in his book, and this is the uh, second part already of, of the book of Zechariah, where he is now prophesizing um, some happier, let's say, uh, prophecies. And it shall be on that day that living water shall go out of Jerusalem, half of them towards the former sea and half of them towards the hinder sea. So everything goes to the east will go to the Dead Sea and everything that goes to the west will go to the Mediterranean. This is actually topographically true as well. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord will be kind over all the earth. And that day shall be one Lord and his name one. So, you know, God willing, I am saying um, that the prophecy of Zechariah will be complete. Jerusalem will be one. The name of God will be one. And uh, we should all be able to come and visit uh, the city of Jerusalem uh, in the future. Amen. And so that was my uh, hour and a half. And uh, I am happy to take uh, questions, people. Go ahead. Start asking me every, anything you want. I'll drink some water while you're collecting your thoughts and coming up with questions. The, <clears throat> the truth, Bena, is that uh, we're, we're still processing. There's so many, so many fascinating things that uh, you brought to our attention. Um, and really a fascinating lecture. Um, and uh, you also raised a lot of interesting questions that we have to think about. For example, the question that you mentioned earlier, um, what was it with that, that you said we'd have to invite you to give another lecture about the first one? You actually did that twice. Yeah, well, there are different things here that deter deserve further uh, attention. One of them, what was it that we said uh, about uh, purity and impurity, I believe one of them was. Um, and again, it, 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 by the way, it all stems from the same place, the uh, idea of impurity and just as much as the idea of purity is what we as people uh, are doing to just uh, mundane objects and all of a sudden we elevate them, we turn them into something else or by touching uh, a dead animal or a dead person, all of a sudden we have uh, brought upon ourselves these new properties of impurity and how do we rid ourselves from them. Um, and to connect this, by the way, with Sukkot, beyond anything else, it's always water. Water seems to have that uh, purifying uh, element to it. And I'll just remind everyone that, uh, that when you read the Parsha, the, the, the reading of the, and we're just about to celebrate, of course, uh, the completion of, uh, of the reading of the Torah. That's the seventh day of Sukkot, is uh, Shvi, and then we're moving to Shmini Yitzhar, and then suddenly we're celebrating, amongst other things, we're also celebrating that we're done reading the Torah. So over the course of 52 or 56 weeks, if it's a leap year, we've completed the reading of the five books of Moses. And we will even begin a little bit of Bereshit. We will start uh, the book of Genesis, and we'll read a little bit of it. But then the second week, as soon as we really kind of get into the book, and after the story of, the, of, of creation, we have the story of Noah and the story of the flood. And so the, the first week 
ends. The reading ends with God creating the world, and then the world is not everything that God has hoped for. And already he is sort of disappointed in his creation, but Noah is good. And immediately, of course, the next reading starts with Noah and how God approaches Noah and tells him, hey, you're going to build me an ark and so on and so forth. And the story of the play comes. Now, if you are God Almighty, you have all the options and you have all the powers, well, then you can push the restart button however way you want. The choice, however, is with water. And so we can see already at the beginning that when the world is bad, when the world is impure, the medium chosen to purify it is water. Judaism is about trying to act in God's way in every way that you can. So how do you actually practice that? Well, you purify yourself by going into a ritual pool, into a mikvah. By the way, the Mishnah even kind of talks about it because uh, it says that uh, we should use water from the Kihon Spring for the libation of water. How bad would it be if I just go to my local cistern and get some water from that? No, the water, just like water that are used in Jewish ritual pools in the mikvah, that is very specific water, Mayim Chaim, the living water that must go through uh, as little as possible of a process. In other words, from the sky directly into the reservoir that is collected from them. And that's it. You cannot simply take water from the tap and fill up your Jewish ritual pool. Well, for libation as well, it seems that we have a similar thing going on. We must use the water from the spring of Gihon. We cannot use other water. And if we have no choice, we will use the water from the Kior. And the Kior, in a way, sort of mimics uh, what we're getting in the spring. But of course, why is spring optimal? Because this is water that hasn't been tampered with, that hasn't been touched, and never had the opportunity of collecting on the other properties of impurity. We know that we're using water that is right for the job. And again, it, it's a symbol of us purifying ourselves. It's not in the same way that we have it in Rosh Hashanah, in, uh, in the Jewish New Year's, or on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. But of course, let's not forget, in both of those, water is a big element as well. The high priest cannot go into the holiest of holies that he only enters once a year on the Day of Atonement before he goes through a process of days of purifying himself. And, and of course, every purification ends with baptism. So baptism is the, is the returning motif here. The baptism of the world, the baptism of the priest, the baptism of Jesus on the Jordan River near Gilgal. They're all uh, moments that, A, allow us to kind of hit the reset button, but B, we are now prepared to receive what is about to be bestowed upon us spiritually. What a wonderful oh. way to end such a fascinating lecture. Any questions? Guys, ask away. Listen, I just want to, first and foremost, just to really give you thanks. Uh, I, 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 like uh, Yair said, I'm still processing. I love what you had to say about uh, the blood uh, in relationship to Zechariah. That's, uh, it, it's, I'd love to get uh, somebody to translate that into English, because that is, is very, very remarkable. Oh, and I mean, it leads to so many other stuff. I, I should be able to, uh, I could probably, Yair, if you'd like, I will send you the, um, at least the place where it is in Hebrew. I'm sure there is an Echarabah. There's got to be, somebody has, I'm sure, translated the commentary on it. Uh, and the story of Zechariah, which is, like I said, a horrible story, but... Uh, but I got to tell you something else, Dean. You have reminded me the, that I owe you something about uh, Sukkot in uh, the Samaritan uh, tradition. So, if you'd like, I could uh, say a minute uh, uh, for a minute or two about that. So, so the Samaritans, for those who are not familiar with the Samaritans, are, uh, and this is where I want to choose my words carefully here. Um, 
they are a group that detaches out of conventional Judaism, or if you ask a Samaritan, Jews have detached from Samaritans. Take your pick um, on, on how you want to see it. But in a way, they are closest to the Sadducees that I just told you about. Now, we can say uh, that they are Sadducees, but this will just oversimplify it to the point that we've dumped it down so much that it's dumb because there are just too many holes in the story to say that the Tzedukim are in fact for sure the Shomronim. But what I can tell you, in the word Samaritan, you can already hear Samaria. And I can also tell you that it, the story of the Samaritans, the locality itself is actually, we've been talking about Judah and Benjamin. I will just remind you that Benjamin is the son of Rachel, okay? His older brother, perhaps even more important from the sons of Rachel to our story, is Joseph. Now, Joseph, for those who don't remember, although he's uh, the favorite son, right? We could talk about favoritism with our patriarchs. They seem to always have a favorite, right? Uh, Abraham favors, well, Abraham didn't favor Ishmael directly, but uh, Rivka, uh, Sarah definitely did. And Isaac, uh, it's not entirely clear that he favors uh, Jacob, but because, you know, Jacob had to dress as Esau, but, but we read about the favoritism between the mothers and the fathers and so on. Well, with Jacob, there is some pretty clear favoritism going on, at least as far as the, the clothes that uh, Joseph is receiving. And that multicolored tunic that later became a great... Uh, theater I've never watched the show I don't know how great it is really but what I can tell you is that uh, along the Jewish timeline the sons of Joseph Menashe and Ephraim are considered as tribes and we read this already in Genesis when Jacob comes uh, down to Egypt just before the end of his life and he blesses his sons he tells Joseph hey Bring your sons over to me. I will bless them. Then there's this famous moment where he puts his hands, the right hand that's supposed to go, and go on the eldest goes on the youngest, and the, 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 the left hand goes on the, on the, and so on. So he's, he's switching the hands, and he tells his, his son tries to change the hands, and so on. But what I'm really trying to get to here is that as later in Judaism, things united in the times of David, around the city of Jerusalem, the truth is it didn't last very long. It only lasted for a generation and a half. Solomon still, as the third king of Israel, still ruled the united monarchy, okay? Um, that is, he's the third king, but I'm, I'm doing Saul a favor and I'm calling him a united monarchy because we know that there are still, he's the first one, he's still sort of getting people used to the idea of monarchy altogether. But the son of Solomon is called Rechabon, and Rechabam is uh, approached by the elders, this body that seems to always coexist with monarchy, with judges, with, pro with prophets. They're called as Kenim, the elders. And uh, for the most part, they're not doing much until they're needed, until they're necessary. And the elders are approaching Rechabam and they say, your father is, he put taxes are so high, the people are suffering, you need to do something about it. You're actually adding more taxes. We cannot pay the taxes. The reply of Rechabam is, well, my father tormented you with whips. I shall torment you with whips with metal spikes on them. In other words, it's going to get worse. Shut up and pay. And um, the result is that these elders actually say, we are not interested in the line of David. All of Israel, we're going to our tents. And we have a split of this united monarchy into a split uh, two entities, two kingdoms that will coexist. A southern kingdom, which is the kingdom of Judah, which swallows perhaps uh, a part of Shimon that was south of them. And of course, the Levites, the priests, they never had a territory of their own. So they had cities in all the tribes. So there were some priests that were part of Judah but then all the other tribes in the north, often referred to as the northern kingdom or the ten tribes, and then later the lost ten tribes, they are appointing a new king 
opposite of Rechabam, they called him Yerobam. It's probably not his real name, but that's not the point. The point is that the tribe that takes the lead, both in locality as well as in the leadership itself, is often Ephraim. Okay, so the sons of Joseph. So that whole Benjamin, Joseph, the sons of Joseph connection, it's all there. And the Samaritans see themselves, and locality-wise, they are 100% correct as those people from that kingdom. In other words, although I cannot tell you what happened from the 10th century BC uh, to today that will describe the timeline, I can tell you that Samaritan describes, A, the place where these people uh, lived. They lived in Shimron. Samaria, by the way, was the capital of the kingdom. So the northern kings lived over there. Um, and, and I can tell you that, in a way, it does sort of portray something about, okay, so what was life uh, back then before the split and immediately after the split. So the Samaritans are probably encapsulating some of that. We can talk about the Samaritans and try to imagine how Judah, beyond the political, but also on the theological sort of develop in one way and, uh, and that the Northern Kingdom developed in another way. I will say this, and with that, I will sort of conclude on that. And I will tell you that Regardless to anything, if you count all the Samaritans in the world today, there are some 700 Samaritans globally. About half of them live in the West Bank. There are the more Palestinian Samaritans, and the other half live in Israeli uh, territory. But uh, if you want to talk about safety of numbers, well, that's a problem for the Samaritans. I can tell you this, I promise after this, I'm done with Samaritans. I met with the Samaritan high priest more than once. And he said, do you want to know what our biggest mistake was? Not going on exile. He said, when we stayed here, we constantly continued to influence from everyone around us. Beyond the influence, we suffered greatly from anyone who entered. And so we suffered in the Byzantine period. You know, early Christians persecuted the Samaritans. We suffered from uh, Islam. They persecuted us not so much. They just forced us to convert to Islam. So while the Jews are out there, wherever that is, during the diaspora years, around wherever it is, and they kind of cling together and they end up being you know, pushed away from the rest of the community, we went through a completely different process where he said, we have a saying in Hebrew, lechtiv nemidina, go build a state. He says, I can't build no state with 700 people. And that's my biggest regret, that perhaps 2,000 years ago, we should have done what you Jews did. We should have left. Then we would have stayed at home. Oh, uh, I think we could probably sit on with Bena for a couple of days uh, with this enormous wealth and depth of knowledge. Um, how about just a final word just to end this? Um, with another verse from Zechariah that uh, that appears a little after the, the verses that you actually brought to us, um, and the connection to Sukkot. You're asking me, or you're about to give it? Ah, uh, I'm enjoying you. I would love for you to say it. it, it you know, well, talking, if you go ahead, because I'm not sure what uh, you're referring. All right, to. we're talking you about the ahead. verse. After the verse, uh, we, we, we all aspire to that day, like you said so beautifully and poetically, to the day when God will be one and his name will be one. And uh, I think that one of the, um, that there's actually a roadmap that is provided by Zechariah on how to achieve this oneness, because it's quite challenging. Everybody's all over the world, like you said, like you just said. Um, <clears throat> but apparently God wants all of the nations to come to Jerusalem on Sukkot and to celebrate Sukkot with us so that we will really have an opportunity to get to know each other and to learn how to uh, serve God together in the, in the temple, which will be a, 
a house of prayer for all nations. And uh, I want to thank everybody for participating um, in, in the summit where we are trying to do exactly that, to learn how to study Hashem's word together, to we'll also be singing together. And as we just did now, we are learning how to walk together to get to know the land, to get to know our heritage, uh, but in a way that brings us together rather than tears us apart. So with that, thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, look forward to much more. Okay, yeah. for the rest of the folks, we have another session in 13 minutes. So I welcome you to connect to the other link. And thanks again, Bina. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Thanks for all your work here. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Bina. Take care. Happy holidays. Thanks, Samantha.